Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord with you guys. Um, I, there's no other place that I would rather be on a Sunday morning than the house of God. And, and that's the truth. That's the truth. Um, the house of God is where he has called all believers to come together and worship the Lord. My father raised me and my brothers um, with this thought in mind, that if we dedicated one day of every week to worship God, to focus in the word of God and to be with his people, that means after a lifetime, we would have dedicated one-seventh of our lives specifically to worshiping him together with the body of Christ. We're not talking about every day that we wake up and we breathe in a, a fresh day and the gift of and enjoy the gift of life and worship him with with who we are and who he's called us to be cuz that's that is what the fullest and the most grand expression of worship is is every day dedicating our lives to him. But when we come together to the body of Christ, we come to the church, we come to the house of God. This is where the Lord meets his people. This is where miracles happen. This is where lives are changed. This is where the Holy Spirit manifests the love of God in the presence and in the assembly of his people. Um, and uh, what a blessing it is to be here on this Sunday morning, as we usher in the Advent season, somebody say Advent. Advent season is, is the time of year that we begin to focus our eyes on the miraculous birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the King. The Child King. Amen. And we're so thankful that we can do that. There's so many things going on in this world. I was cracking up today when Brother Steve was talking about Otani. Some of you didn't know what he was talking about. It was that the Dodgers signed a player from the Los Angeles Angels for $700 million over the course of 10 years, which is ridiculous to me. I'm a Dodger fan. I played for the Dodgers, but I'm just, I can't fathom that. That's just, I'm, I'm torn. I'm torn on that. Um, maybe I'm just a little bitter, huh? <laughs> well, it's, uh, no. But, you know, in all seriousness, there's so many things going on in the world, and yet the Lord wants our undivided attention. There's so many bad news. There's so many things that we learn about that breaks our heart, right? Um, you turn on the news, and you hear, or you watch, or you read an article about people dying, we read about the things that um, our generation faces, the challenges that our children face. How many of you know that our young people are going through a whole lot right now? You know, adjustment phases of, of learning who they are in Christ, wanting to make godly bonds and friendships in school. We, my wife and I have three children, two teenagers, and a seven-year-old going on 15, baby girl. We know all the, the challenges that life bring. Um, and, and that's why we are in need of some good news. And I believe that's why the Lord sent his angels. I believe the Lord sent his angels to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. To proclaim glad tidings. To break into the darkness 
that we experience here in the world. That's why Christmas is filled with so much cheer, lights, joy, warmth, gifts even. Being reminded of the greatest gift that was ever given in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today we're not going to teach or preach on the three wise men or the three kings. That's, that's for next week. The gifts that they brought. But today we will focus on the good news that was heralded by the angels. We're going to learn about the angel Gabriel. The angelic host that appeared to the shepherds. It's angelic intervention, angelic proclamation that we as the church get a chance to connect our or hitch our trailers to in terms of our faith. Because the miraculous birth of Jesus and the fact that he was born of a virgin, it was no small ordeal. No small ordeal. The, um, the event or the birth of Jesus had both historic and cosmic implications for the world. Had it not been for the angelic proclamation, the visitations, the visitations in the dreams to various individuals, the event that we call the virgin birth of Jesus Christ through Mary would have stood alone all by itself. Not to say that the miraculous birth of Jesus needed anything else. We know that God needs no defense. He can handle things all by himself. But the angelic visitation and the angelic intervention, the proclamation of what was to come was part of the greater fulfillment of the messianic prophecies of Jesus' birth. And the angelic proclamation lend to the credibility and the, the validity of the scriptures. The validity of the prophets, such as Isaiah or Micah, and reference to, references to 2 Samuel, following in the Davidic lineage that Jesus was born. Today I hope to bring us through several scriptures, about six to be exact. And in these six scriptures, we're going to learn about these angelic visitations. And how significant they were in setting up and preparing the way for the birth of Jesus. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Hold your finger there. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to join us in our study of the scriptures today. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, on this Sunday morning, we ask that you would enter our hearts, that you'd meet us right here in this place, Father God, and that your word, Lord Jesus, would strengthen us, encourage us, build our faith. Lord God, I pray that you would open our minds, you'd open our hearts, and you'd open our spiritual eyes that we might see wonderful things in your word today. We thank you, Father, for keeping your promise. We thank you for fulfilling the word that you brought to the prophets of old in the birth of Jesus, where you became one of us. You took on flesh because we needed you. And there was no other way for this world to be redeemed. 
but for the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah, and all that he means to us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus and the people of God said, amen. Give God a hand of praise today, church. <laughs> Hallelujah. The angels, in essence, helped to protect, to preserve, and fulfill the messianic prophecies. Whenever you hear me say messianic, I'm referring to the Messiah. And prophecies speaking to words that were foretold about future events that would come to pass. Amen? So when the angels appeared to various individuals over the course of one full year, and then again three years later, and we're going to get into all of these, they serve to help us focus on good news. I know I'm in need of good news. Because if I don't allow the good news of Christ to consume my life, if I don't allow the good news of Jesus Christ to take over my life, I can get so bogged down, and I believe that we can, we can get so stuck in our own problems, in our own situations, in our own circumstances, even to the point of doubting God, even to the point of our faith suffering, when all we focus on is what is in front of us. We need to hear the good news, and we have to be reminded of the good news. And that's why we as human beings have to be consistent. And that's why every week we come together and worship. If we stop to come together and worship, if we forsook the gathering of the people of God and the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God, there would be a part of us that would cause us to be weak in our faith. But we have to be reminded. We have to be reminded of the goodness of God. Through the good news. Amen? Amen? Through the evangel. The angels came to prepare the way both for John the Baptist and Jesus. And how many of you know that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin? The scripture teaches us that Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who was up in age and was not able to have a child, gave birth to John the Baptist. And it was a miracle that she was even able to have a child in her older age. And Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary. They were cousins. And that allows us to see this familial connection. We're going to see that the angels appear to Zechariah, who is the husband of Elizabeth, okay? And Zechariah and Elizabeth are pertaining to the maternal side of Jesus of Nazareth. Whereas Joseph, the paternal side of Jesus, we're going to see how, what Matthew has to say about him. Whereas Luke focuses primarily on Jesus' maternal side, okay? And Luke is very consistent throughout his whole gospel in highlighting the involvement of women in the story of Jesus. Whereas Matthew primarily focused on bringing the gospel to the Jews so that his own people would be able to understand and recognize Jesus as Messiah being the one that they had all been expecting and waiting for. How many of you are tracking with me thus far? What is more is that in the Gospel of Matthew, this Jewish, very Jewish account of the birth narrative of Jesus, we're going to see that he focuses on the Davidic lineage or the kingly family line that Jesus comes from that he began with giving us the genealogy in the beginning of Matthew chapter 1. Amen? 
So you see, I'm, I'm going at this with a different pace today, and I'm wanting to bring a different kind of understanding for all of us, right? In hopes that we can make some connections in the Gospels for ourselves as we go into this Christmas season, we can add a few arrows to our quiver. Amen? Amen. Not only did the angels appear to the family line of Jesus, all right, but they also appeared to the lowly shepherds that were out in the hills, hillsides of Bethlehem. Pastor Joe brought it to my attention that these shepherds were um, very unique in that they were watching over the sheep that were used for the sacrifices that would normally be made at the temple. And that for us foreshadows and also highlights the fact that Jesus, being the ultimate sacrifice or Lamb of God, also is very consistent with this idea that the angels came to the shepherds who happened to be watching over the sheep just outside of Bethlehem. Amen? So we're going to see that these four various accounts of witnesses, different witnesses with this divine intervention also add what is called multiple attestations. It means that there are multiple individuals or groups that can attest to the accounts that happened or that took place. All right? And these are all very, very important because I hope to appeal to the intellectual side of us as Christians. All right? Our faith is not just a bunch of emotion. All right? Our, our faith is, is not just about passion. Although we're a very passionate people because we're Pentecostals. We like, to, we like to get excited. We like to shout. We like to scream. We like to hot. Well, sometimes, sometimes you might even see me dance up here like David. Except, except with my clothes on. <laughs> Hallelujah. So now let's turn to the scriptures. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 20. This is the first that we will see of the angel Gabriel appearing to Zechariah. Verses 11 through 20. It says this. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear, us, bear you a son, and you're to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. So here also we learn about the fact that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Even before Luke promises the, the gift of the promise of the Father at the end of the, the gospel in chapter 24, that the Father would pour out his Spirit upon all people. So Luke is very, very, very keen in how he writes and what he includes in his gospel account or his book. Verse 16. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. Somebody say amen for John the Baptist. Amen. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I love John's, excuse, John the Baptist's calling to reach all people. And the way Luke writes is very inclusive in that. He shows a gospel account that is for everyone. Amen? And it's very unique. Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And here it is. This is where we get the account that this angel of the Lord is Gabriel. The angel answers and says, 
I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. All right. So here we are. We have the first angelic visitation, and it's not to Mary, okay? It's not to Joseph, all right, the, the parents of Jesus, all right? But who is it to? Zechariah. And we've seen that the significance of this is because John the Baptist is going to be born before Jesus. And so it's, it's very consistent in keeping with the chronological flow or the purposes of both John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. The fact that John the Baptist would come preparing the way for Jesus. Amen? I like to encourage us to connect to John the Baptist's calling and his purpose as people who are also bringing forth the message of Jesus Christ in some, some ways and some, sometimes preparing the hearts to receive Jesus. We bring who we are and everything that God is in us wherever we go. We get to walk in the spirit of John the Baptist, sharing the good news of the Messiah. Right? John the Baptist knew that this whole thing was not going to be about him. Remember when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, and he pointed his own disciples to Jesus himself later on in their ministries. Praise the Lord for that. So the angel Gabriel comes and he speaks to the fulfillment of Scripture that John the Baptist will prepare the way for Messiah. He also says, Zechariah, by the way, God has heard your prayers. Matter of fact, we've all heard the prayers of you and your wife. And the time is now. And it has come for her to bring forth a child, your wife Elizabeth, in her older age. Man, isn't that a blessing? What an encouragement to us to know that as we faithfully serve the Lord, as we faithfully set aside time in our prayer lives, we set aside time to write down our requests unto God. The Lord hears our prayers. The Lord hears our prayers. He sees us. He sees you where you're at right now. And he will see to it that he responds to our prayers. He doesn't always respond to our prayers the way we hope, the way we'd like. But he hears our prayers. He sees us. He sees you. I want you to know that you matter. He sees me. He sees my heart. He sees the things that, that you go through in your own personal life. And the Lord is sending his angels to comfort you. The Lord is sending his angels to come alongside you to remind you that God has heard your prayers. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's continue on now to the second visitation. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. The angel Gabriel now appears to Mary. And this is what it says. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel... To Nazareth. So this is six months later, you guys. A town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. You'll be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Praise the Lord. Here we're not only seeing these angels visiting these chosen instruments and vessels of God, but we're, able, we're also able to see and learn about their, their dialogue. What was said. We see that Luke, in the beginning of chapter 1, when he opens up his gospel account, he says, you have heard the, the accounts before, but since I have also full knowledge of all the accounts of Jesus Christ, I have seen fit and have been called to write my own account. So Luke is going to give us this fuller expression of the accounts of Jesus' birth, which I think are wonderful for us as believers. Especially if you're a thinking person, you know that when you have multiple accounts, of the same situation and can pull different information together, it also provides greater support for the other account, right? So it strengthens the case. It strengthens the case for Christ. It strengthens the case, furthermore, for the miraculous and virgin birth of Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, the angel's visitation right here and Luke's account is also going to speak specifically to the Isianic prophecies that we found in chapter 7 verse 14 and following which Pastor Koba led us through last week speaking of the virgin birth amen, amen. and then Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 where we learn about the place of Galilee and the darkness that the birth of Jesus was going to shed light upon. Praise the Lord. So we are getting a fuller understanding, you guys, of the story of Jesus. And just a couple of weeks when, when we have the, the Christmas program here, the Grinch, who found Jesus, right? We always we like to, to reenact, right, the, the manger narrative, the stories of the shepherds and the angels, right, and the baby Jesus, right, and Mary and Joseph. And the donkeys, right? And the, little, and the little vacas. And the sheep next to the manger, right? All of these, you, and, the, and the three wise men. How can, how can I forget the three wise men or the three kings? Well, guess what? This is what we call Christian tradition. Christian tradition. And Christian tradition means we are pulling from all the biblical accounts, not just... The, the gospel accounts, but the biblical accounts and bringing them together for a fuller expression of the birth narrative of Jesus. Okay? So it doesn't mean that chronologically everything happened all sequentially and or all at once. In the scriptures, you guys, if you actually pull out a pen and, and a notebook and a journal and you start writing and, and, and learning and finding out the sequence of events, you're going to see that Sometimes there was a greater span of time that actually took place than what we actually really understood. Isn't that beautiful? Like by the time the wise men had come to Jesus to worship and bring their gifts, it had probably been about two years. 
because they had traveled. Jesus was already a little, not just a, a, a newborn infant, was a, but was a little bit older. Because it took a long time to travel from, from the east. So we see right here in, in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, this conversation that Mary is having with the angel. It says, Mary, O woman who is highly favored of God. Man, what a beautiful, beautiful compliment for women. Women, you are, you are mightily used of God in the story of God and the story of Jesus. Women, you play a vital role in the body of Christ today. Your calling, the way that you hold your, your Jesus in your heart, the way you nurture us. In the body of Christ, to a fullness of faith, a fuller, more wonderful expression of what it means to adore and worship Jesus Christ the King. Amen? Praise the Lord for you ladies. I want to give you ladies a round of applause and say thank you. I love how Mary asks her questions and the angel responds patiently. He said, well, how can this be? And we, we get all these understanding. And women, you're, you're so detail-oriented. Like, hey, Josh, go to the store. I need you to buy a list of groceries. All right, all right. I'll see you later. And I leave. And I'm like, oh, wait, what, what did you need? What did you need, baby? Well, we're just so excited to just go and do sometimes, right? Thank the Lord for the sisters. Let's move on to the third visitation. Let's go to Matthew. They're going to back up a couple of books. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 24. And this is where the angel Gabriel appears to Joseph in a dream. Let's see what it says. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, speaking about Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. All right, stop there. Now, I want you to see right here in Matthew chapter 1 that Matthew goes straight to the angel of the Lord's visit to who? To who? To Joseph. It completely skips the angel's visit to Mary. Okay? It's because Matthew was more interested in bringing about, okay, the proof that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's speaking to a Jewish audience, primarily, the Gospel of Matthew. And so that's why there's going to be a heavy leaning towards the Davidic lineage, which connects. Jesus' earthly father, not his biological father, but his earthly father, to the line of King David. Are we tracking now, church? So it's very interesting now that when we piece the stories together, we see that the angel of the Lord here in Matthew, for us, we're going to call this angel of the Lord who? Gabriel. Because it's consistent with the birth narrative stories of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So now that we're, we're still all on the same page and we're all tracking together, let's now look at what is taking place here in Matthew, which is very different from Luke's account of the angelic visitation. One of the things that we see here is that rather than the angels simply appearing 
to Joseph in person, like we read about in Luke. Luke says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah at the temple. He was there at the altar. Here in Matthew, we see that the angel appears to Joseph how? Through a dream. And that's Matthew's account for us to understand as believers that God speaks to us, can communicate to us, can intervene, all right, and involve himself with us in many different ways. It doesn't mean that every single dream that we have is going to come to pass or come to fruition. Let's be honest, some of us have some pretty interesting dreams, to put it kindly. Praise the Lord, all right? But when God chooses to speak to his people through dreams, right, these can be seen as prophetic visitations where we receive the very message or these, the very good word or, or good news, excuse me, of what God is going to do in your life or in someone else's life or in a future event. Okay, some of us even have the gift of interpreting dreams. All right, I know there are lots of gifts here in the body of Christ. We are a church that recognizes the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the supernatural gifts. I believe that God has given us the gifts in the body of Christ in order for us to have a fuller, a greater experience and understanding of who God is for the building up of the body of Christ in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so it's, it's good for us to understand that God can speak to us through dreams, all right? Now, when God, when, when God sends the angel of the Lord, and we're going to call him the angel Gabriel, to Joseph, all right? One of the things that I love about Joseph, and I think is very, very important, is that every time the angel visits him, he gives him instructions. And the instructions always had a purpose, and Joseph was obedient. Joseph followed the instructions that the angel of the Lord had given him. In this first visitation, we see that the, the angel visits to intervene and prevent Joseph from making a terrible mistake. We see that in the verses prior to what we just read, Joseph was about to break off the engagement, okay, to Mary. He was about to, the Bible says, put her away privately because she was found with child. Luke, thankfully, gives us the greater understanding that Mary had a little bit of heads up about this situation before Joseph. Because if you only had Matthew, you would only be piecing together what you know about what Matthew has said. And that would have made things a little bit more confusing for us to understand fully. But Luke allows us to know that Mary had a heads up from the angel Gabriel that she was highly favored of God and that the Holy Spirit had caused her to conceive a child in her womb and that she would bring forth the Savior of the world. So Matthew doesn't give us the full background of the conversations that he and Mary had, and that may not be important. The most important thing was that the angel came to stop Joseph in his tracks from doing what he was going to do in his own natural thought and mind. How many of you guys know that oftentimes we too, in our own rationale, in our own logic, all right, find ourselves doing things that sometimes are outside of God's will? And that's because of the flesh. It's because of fear sometimes. It's because of excitement. Maybe it's, um, it could be simply an era of enthusiasm. We get ahead of the game. We get ahead of God, right? We, we end up taking things into our own hands. And praise the Lord. If we faithfully seek the Lord, faithfully walk with him, faithfully grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus, we'll learn to slow down. We'll learn to listen better. We'll learn to look for the signs of God, especially when it comes to great 
and big decisions in our lives. We're learning to invite God into our plans, into our decisions, so that we're not acting outside of the will of God, but we're actually disciplining ourselves as Christians to act in the will of God so that we can not only obey his word, obey his command, but do his will and align our will and our lives with God's. So we see here that Joseph says, okay, whoa, I, yeah, I was about to divorce her. I was about to break from her because she's pregnant and we never slept together. But well, we see here that when the angel comes to Joseph, the angel is now creating a confirmation of what God had already set in motion. And it lends a greater credibility for Joseph, who was a thinking man, to see that God was up to something that was beyond his, 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 his own natural comprehension. And that's the power of the believer. That's the power that you and I possess, is that we have access to faith in God. Okay? It's important for us to ask ourselves, how is our faith? How is your faith? This last couple of weeks, I've been asking my boys, hey, boys, how's your faith? Oh, what do you mean, Dad? You mean my, my faith in God? Yeah, your faith in God and faith, believing that God can do all things. I'm working on it, Dad. One of my boys says, sometimes my faith is stronger certain days than others. I said, praise the Lord. I think we're all in that situation. But prayerfully, we can all continue to grow. We can all continue to grow to the point where we are recognizing who God is and able to step out in obedience and trusting in a plan that we can't even see the full picture yet. Amen? That's what we're called to as believers, to step out into things and situations that we believe God is still walking with us through, holding our hand through, and then saying, okay, now let's go together. And that's what Joseph was doing here when he was receiving these visitations by the angels in his dreams. Praise the Lord. What I also appreciate and love about the angel Gabriel's visitation to Joseph is that the angel came doing God's bidding, alleviating Joseph's worry, his preoccupation, and his situation. And that's what, it, that's what it means for us, you guys, to invite the Lord into our situations in prayer. In prayer. And trusting the Lord. Hallelujah. Now let's, let's do our math. Thus far, we've had three different people who have received visits from angels. Namely, the angel of the Lord, the angel Gabriel. The first was who? Zechariah. Then the next was? Mary. Close. Now he's, he's, he's the sharpest and brightest theologian we have in this place. My papa. And then the third was? Joseph. No apologies needed, Pop. So we have three different people now that the Lord is building a case for himself, for his son, strengthening the testimonies, strengthening the cloud of witnesses, strengthening the story and the birth narrative of Jesus of Nazareth. Not only Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the Savior, the King of Kings. God is painting a picture and telling a story where he is involving now three different witness accounts where the angels intervene and involve themselves with humanity. That means heaven came to earth, Oscar. 
It means that when you and I, we wake up and our feet hit the ground, it means that the spirit of Christ in us, who meets the flesh, the body, the person who is Josh, who is Ray, Ernest Ray Gonzalez, walks in the greatest and fullest expression of both God and man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It means that God has chosen to intervene with us. And that he's not just some God who's sitting up somewhere on a cloud with his hands crossed, looking down on, oh boy, those poor people. No, God loves us and he cares for us. And the whole reason why he's gone through all of this is to demonstrate his love. It's to show us how much he loves us. And he's putting, putting everything together in good and proper order, just like he always does. Thank you, Lord. What a, what a help that is for those of us who are anal retentive. I, I, and, I, and I include myself in that. Oh, man, sometimes I just need to have things all just right. Right? And the older I get, I find myself becoming a, a, a better dishwasher and a, a better keeper of the kitchen because when I cook, I got to clean everything and I look for everything. I got to make sure everything's right. Well, guess what? If you're the kind of person who likes to lean on the scripture and continue to grow in your faith, then I pray that learning and understanding the fullness of how God intervenes with us is helpful to your faith and helps you grow in your faith. Amen? Amen. All right, let's continue. So Joseph obeys the command of the angel. He goes back home to Mary. He says, well, I want to tell you about a dream that I had. <laughs> uh, and in this dream, this angel came to me. And she's like, yes, I already know him. Except he didn't come to me in a dream. We actually had a conversation. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 15. We're going back now to Luke's gospel, Luke the evangelist, okay? Remember, Luke was not one of the original apostles or disciples, but he was a couple of uh, degrees removed from Jesus' original apostles or disciples. But he was very um, diligent in what he did, and that is why his, his gospel account is very meticulous, very detailed in the way that we are learning. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, we're going to see that the angel Gabriel appears now to the shepherds along with the heavenly host. So let's read verses 8 through 15 of chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Amen. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For I bring good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Amen. That's us, you guys. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We have found peace through Jesus Christ. We no longer have to live at odds with God. Hallelujah. A natural remedy for high blood pressure. Read the word of God. Pray. Breathe. Slowly and deeply, and let the Lord minister to us and give you the peace that you're seeking. Amen? When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Wow! If Zechariah and Joseph and Mary... We're not enough. God said, we must now break from the paternal 
and maternal sides of this baby that's being born so that people aren't going around saying that's just some crazy family trying to position themselves for political gain. This family that's going to go around spreading all these rumors and people gossiping, I mean, they're already going to start spreading the news about what was taking place and going on. But God saw fit to go and speak to the shepherds to bring an outside witness. And there were multiple shepherds. It wasn't just one. There was multiple shepherds. It wasn't just one angel that appeared to the shepherds. But the Bible says that the angel Gabriel appeared with the heavenly host. Ain't that great? The heavenly hosts were there, you guys, proclaiming this tremendous, tremendous event. Hallelujah. Oh, man, that just encourages me to no end. Come on. Let's go quickly now. I wish I could spend more time, but we're going to have to finish. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 2. This is the fifth angelic visitation in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. All right. And these are a little bit outside of the, the primary birth narrative of Jesus. All right. But they are pertaining to Jesus' Jesus's story. But let's see what it says. Because it's very consistent with the way Matthew presents the visitation of the angel to Joseph. Verse 13 says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. We, once again, he appears in a dream. He says, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So we see here that the angel appears to Joseph again in a dream and gives him instructions. And Joseph is faithful and obedient in listening to the angel since he saw that the things that were foretold to him from before came to pass. So now Joseph has no problem with following the command of God through this messenger because that's what angel means. Angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. All right, so we see that these angels are messengers bringing the messages of God, all right, to his people for his purposes. So Joseph takes Mary and Joseph and they leave, all right, this, the region of Israel and they go south to Egypt where they can just hide out, they can blend in. Does anybody know why? It's because King Herod, who had heard that this child king was born, wanted to eliminate any threats to the throne. They wanted to try and root out anything that would prevent him from continuing to have his own family line serving in the form of a puppet king, right? Because the Romans were the leading entity. The Roman Empire was still well established at the time. So the Jews allowed them, them uh, the, the, the Romans allowed the Jews to have their own leaders, but they were puppet leaders, right? Just as long as they stayed out of the way of the Roman affairs, the Jews can have some of the things that they wanted, including a king, right? So we see here that Herod rounds up all the, the baby boys that were two years and under and killed them all. This is also prophesied about in the Old Testament about the sons of Rachel and that the weeping of Rachel would be heard. And sure enough, all the baby boys all throughout Jerusalem and the surrounding cities and, and, and villages and towns were gathered up and they were all killed. That's called infanticide. Okay, and King Herod was doing that. But to preserve this, this child who was born named Jesus, who was Messiah, to see to it that the, the fulfillment of Jesus' life would come to pass, Joseph and Mary had to abide by the very practical instructions and command of God and remove them from harm's way. 
And God does that too with us. Sometimes as Christians, we can also fall temptation to over-spiritualizing everything. Oh, God's got me. Oh, God's going to protect me. Oh, oh, God's got my back. I'm just going to stay here in this crappy, ugly, hurtful, toxic situation where people are harming me. Right? I'm, you, but I'm good. Where in fact, sometimes God says, you know what? Actually, uh, I don't want your children to be pruned before they're meant to be pruned. And there's a better situation for your children. And, and you just got to follow this right here because guess what? I'm over there too. I'm over there too. You see, I'm the God of the universe. I'm not just the God of Israel. I'm also the God of Egypt. And I have plans for this young boy, my son. And I don't want you guys to have to be looking over your shoulder all the time. I don't want you to live under that kind of anxiety and that worry. I want you to let him go and enjoy a nice, wonderful, fully expressed childhood. Running and jumping and playing and learning multiple languages. Amen? Praise the Lord. We serve a wonderful God, uh, the cosmic engineer who knows why he does things the way he does them. I'm just so glad that I'm not him. <laughs> and I don't have to try to be, and neither do you. But we have to learn how to trust in him. And finally, Matthew chapter 2, verses 19, 19 through 20, about four years later, after all of this, you guys, It says, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord, Gabriel, appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. How did he appear to Joseph? In a dream. Matthew loves, loves uh, conveying this story through dreams and said, get up. It's time. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Hallelujah. Church, let us stand. And so, there we have it. Joseph and Mary and Jesus return to Israel. Only they decided to raise Jesus in Nazareth, in the northern part of Israel, not in Jerusalem. So that he could, they could still stay under the radar and steer clear of any of Herod's lineage or family line that would... would Try also to, to seek out and root out this threat to the throne, the throne of David. Amen? The throne of David. We see here that the angels that God chose to be involved in the story of Jesus helped to protect, preserve, and develop the story of Christmas. There wouldn't be a Christmas story without them. I love how God involves so many others. How God involves us in proclaiming the good news of Jesus. My prayer for us is that this Christmas we might be that angel to someone. You might be a messenger of the love of God and the story of Jesus, the miraculous virgin birth of our King that we might not deny it, that we wouldn't doubt it, but that we would be firmly rooted and firmly established in this miracle, in this impossibility that only God could do. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for 
the way that you do things. We thank you, Father God, for the angels, the angels who are here with us right now. We're in their presence right now. There's a choir of angels that are here with us. There's angels that that go with us, Father, even as we leave this place. Help us, Father God, to connect to you in this greater way of our faith, of our understanding, and of our belief. Lord God, we thank you for coming to us and the way that you did with this wonderful story. We thank you for the angels, your messengers who interacted with your servants. May you always remember us as well, Lord Jesus. And we welcome angelic visitation. We welcome you into our dreams. We welcome you, Father God, your word, your will, your instructions, your commands for our lives. Might we be found obedient. Forgive us for our sins. And help us, Father, to celebrate this great Christmas story this year. In Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen and amen. God bless you, Mission Ebenezer Family Church. Let us proclaim with the angels that Jesus is born.